Well, good morning, everybody. It is great, as always, to be with you in the house of the Lord. And I think I was especially excited this morning because I took the stage way too soon. But anyway, I've enjoyed standing here and looking at your smiling faces this morning. You know, one of the reasons that I love church is something somebody said earlier. I can't remember who said it in service. But it's so great to come together and to celebrate what happens in a life when somebody learns to be loved well by God and when somebody learns to be led well by God. Can you give me a great big amen? And I want to encourage you to let us know what God's doing in your life through prayer request forms or email us up here at the church because if God's house is to be a house of prayer for all people, how many of you know we want to celebrate that, don't we? And we want to give God glory for the things that he's doing in our life. You know, it's hard to be born into the world in a place of spiritual ignorance. Many of us were. We were born and we didn't have a clue about how to walk with God. And then you've got to fight through your own sinful tendencies that keep you from experiencing God's love and experiencing God's leadership well. And then we live in a culture that has been secularized. Secular humanism simply means that secular means ignore all the sacred things that God's done throughout history. Ignore the Bible. Ignore the fact God sent his son. After all, you want to be in control of your life anyway, don't you? And then humanism says, put yourself at the center of your world. After all, you can experience things that you like that way. And this morning, we're going to study a great text about why you don't want to do that and why we pray that our society will turn away from that. Uh, but before we do, I don't always uh, speak quite this long during my opening, and I often don't share a scripture first, but I do want to share one this morning, and then we're going to pray and get into God's word. This is God talking to the prophet Isaiah. Everybody say Isaiah. Isaiah. And Isaiah says twice that the mouth of the Lord wants us to hear this. And I want you to read it. It says, come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. You know, where sin reigns, there's a lot to settle in a society, isn't there? And God says, I'm going to tell you the best way to settle it. He said, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they're red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And then he says in the next verse... If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. I believe that's one of the greatest calls on the body of Christ today. And that is how many of you want to demonstrate that obedience to God causes life to go better than any other way we could possibly live. Amen. How many of you all want to see our culture drawn into the goodness of God in this season that we're in? And then he says, and this happened to them because the church didn't or the faith community didn't do this. He said, but if you resist and rebel... You're going to be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so, really, it was sobering, wasn't it? And today's message, I'm going to just warn you before we start that I have it in a celebratory context, but it's a very sobering thing, what we're going to study in terms of what the Apostle Paul communicated. And it really lets us know that the primary role of the church, our primary reason for being here this morning, is discipleship. Yes, when you have a great church, you also have people who have gifts that they express, and it causes wonderful things to go on all around us, and we can create wonderful programs that our children enjoy, but the primary task of the church is to grow great lives through discipleship. Can somebody give me a good amen? And you know, none of us are going to be part of every program in the church. I remember years ago that uh, I thought it'd be so good on Good Friday to invite the blood bank. And I told you, Jesus gave his blood. Now you give your blood on Good Friday. A lot of you didn't take part in that program. I'm not sure why. But, you know, we all have different gifts. We all have programs. But the most important thing, and we're going to hear this today, is that we come to church ready to be great disciples of the Lord Jesus. And we thank him for what he's doing in our children's lives because we're teaching them to be great disciples. Can somebody say amen? So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, thank you for showing us in the Bible what causes truth to get suppressed among a people, and God, what causes truth to be valued and the glory of God to be valued and to bless lots of people. Lord, today we want to be the people that you need in the hour we're living in, so we set our hearts to hear from you in Jesus' name, and everybody said have you noticed that prayer is the most commonly practiced spiritual value in the world? 
According to the Pew Research Group here in America, 79% of people say they've prayed at least once in the last three months, and 55% of Americans say that they pray every single day. Now, why do we pray as often as we pray? It's because there's something in our hearts that craves experiencing God as a game changer. We all have circumstances that are in front of us every day, and uh, we don't know how to handle those circumstances in our own wisdom and in our own power. And even if we have confidence in our own wisdom and power, the reality is that we can't bless ourselves the way that God can bless us. We can't protect ourselves the way that God can protect us. And so God has created in our heart a desire to pray and to experience Him. And I remember when it was about the sixth year of my Christian walk that I really knew that I had learned how to experience God, and I was starting to experience God on a regular basis in my life, and it brought such a settling to me and such a satisfaction to me. And don't get me wrong, the Bible says we groan and we go through difficult things because of sin, but the reality is I knew that I was going to experience the goodness of the Lord for the rest of my life. And I want to share just one story that happened to me that year. I was getting ready to go to post Idi Amin, a, a Uganda, and most of you may not know that Idi Amin back in the day was one of the most atrocious dictators that lived on the planet, and during that time, I didn't realize it was going to be my first year in a long time of full-time ministry because I was praying. I didn't know if I was supposed to be part of the clergy or if I was supposed to serve the community in some other way. I just knew that I was called to serve community. And that's really a big reason that Tamara broke up with me the first time. I don't talk about it a lot, but she knew she was called to marry a pastor, and she knew I was Mr. Magoo without a clue of where I was going in my life, right? And uh, what we're going to see today is we're all kind of Mr. Magoo without a clue because we don't have the ability to discern everything that God wants to do in our life, but it's really the ability that we have to experience the glory of God. God that causes us to experience the goodness of God in our life. It's why Moses said to the Lord, whenever God was telling him to take the children of Israel into the promised land, do you remember what Moses said? He said, God, I can't do this, but he said, your glory is going to have to go before us if this is going to be pulled off in our midst. And for all of us today, there are things we're praying about in relationships. There are promises God's made us both in his word and through the voice voice of the Spirit in our heart, and it's only the glory of God that's going to carry us into the things that we're praying to God about happening in our lives. And here's the reality. Sin creates a gory world around all of us, but we're called to experience God's glory, and because of that, we're to experience God doing glorious things in our life. Let me talk to you about 1983, because whenever I was praying before I got on the plane that year, that this sense came into my heart that God was going to allow me to speak to the nation of Uganda in a very significant way. And I didn't say anything to anybody about it, but I was there 10 weeks, and for the first seven weeks, I traveled throughout the country, and the, the network that hosted me had 500 churches, and so I had a good time staying in the homes of believers and uh, speaking mostly to youth groups. Every once in a while, there was a pastor who was either tired or he wanted a next generation voice, and he gave me a shot in his pulpit. But at about the seven and a half week point, I looked at my interpreter who traveled with me the whole time, and I told him what I said that God had put in my heart. And we both laughed about it because we knew, knew that nobody wanted a 23-year-old to say something significant to a nation. But before we left, I felt one morning I was to take him to this nice restaurant in town to thank him for traveling with me and to give him a gift before he started uh, the East Africa School of Theology as a student. And when we were there, how would we ever know as we're laughing and talking about what God has done in our lives that the director of religious programming for the nation of Uganda pulled up in a group and sat right beside us and she came to our table after 
afterwards, and she said, the young people of our nation need people like you to talk to them. And she postponed the programming that she had scheduled, and guess who was speaking to the whole nation on national television? Your pastor, because how many of you know when we don't have a clue of what to do, our God makes a way where there seems to be no way. Can you say amen? And this morning, what we're going to talk about are, are, are how God's glory is suppressed in not just our lives, but in a culture. We're going to talk about uh, our nation a lot this morning, and then we're going to talk about how sin gets strengthened in a culture, and ultimately, we're going to talk about what releases the glory of God into your family and into our culture. And uh, remember that this is the last message in 11 on the Lord's Prayer, and Jesus is teaching us how to experience more of God's work in the circumstances of our life. And these last three messages have focused on the doxology of the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus says, God's is the kingdom, and God's is the power, and God's is the glory. Now, God's is the kingdom reminds us that we're to live our lives not the way we think it should be lived, but we're to live our life under the love and the leadership of God. God's is the power means that our accomplishments shouldn't be entirely based on our own ability, but they should be based on the ability of what God is doing through us. And God's is the glory means that the anointing of God that's been given to every single one of us should be something we highly treasure because of what he's causing to happen in our life and in our world. And the Apostle Paul, in the verses that we're going to study today, starts in verse 16 of Romans 1 by telling us why it is that he was willing to be a preacher of the gospel who played his role and who took the responsibility that he took in spite of the great persecution that he endured as a person. And he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it it, it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone's life. And he says it came first to the Jew. And then after that, of course, it was mostly Jewish people in the upper room who Jesus said, I now want the salvation of God to spread into all the earth. And then Paul talks about what causes the gospel to save lives. When he says, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Now, I I read a New International Version uh, when I preach to you, and I left the heading of the New International Version on your outlines for a reason, because the next verse talks about God's wrath against sinful humanity, and it starts telling us the kind of things that cause God to get angry. If you're a parent, you get angry about things. You get angry whenever something harms your child. You get angry whenever you see see your child not doing the things that are going to make their life great. You get angry whenever your kids do things to harm one another. And in the same way, our God is not this kind little person who never gets angry, but God gets angry about some things. And the Bible says this is what really makes God mad. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and the wickedness of people who are suppressing the truth by their wickedness. So what is it that causes God's truth to be suppressed? Well, God's truth is suppressed whenever people desire their truth to reign instead of desiring God's truth to reign. People desire to live ungodly, but to say, no, it's not ungodly. This is okay. People desire to live wicked towards each other and say, no, this isn't wicked. This is okay. And God says, I get angry at that, not because I'm angry at people, but because I love people so much and I want their lives to be so wonderful, I want to clear up the godlessness and I want to clear up the wickedness so I can begin blessing people more than they're blessed. Now, when we stand for what God stands for, we have two powerful allies that God has put on the earth to help us. And the first one is creation itself. Paul goes on to say this, that, you know, what may be known about God is made plain to people because God made it plain to them. 
And since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what's been made so that people are without excuse. So when people look at creation, we know two things. Number one, God is more powerful than us because though man has invented lots of things, nobody has made a universe. Can somebody say amen? The second thing we know is his nature, that we look at, at creation and we say, you know what? God created a really cool place for us to live on, and that's why bad behavior isn't tolerated anywhere in the world. You always see a religion that rises up and tries to make people's behavior better, and the reason is we can see from creation that God made this planet, and we as people should learn how to enjoy life on this planet. Now, the, the Bible goes on to say this in the next verse, that this is why God can't reign in a life, in a family, in a culture. It's because although people know God, they don't glorify Him as God or give thanks to Him, but their thinking becomes futile and their foolish hearts end up darkened. And they claim to be wise, but they become fools and they exchange the glory of God, uh, the immortal God, for images that are made to look like a human being and of birds and animals and reptiles. Of course, Paul was writing this to a Rome that believed in many, many gods. And whenever he said their thinking is futile, another version says their thinking was godless. Another version says that they had foolish ideas of what God was like. And it's because the root of the Greek word that's translated futile is the word idolatrous, which means that they began to worship something that really wasn't God instead of worshiping who God really is. Now, in our culture, that might be money, that might be family, that might be sinful pleasures that we don't want to give up on, but we fight this battle because we're a secular humanistic society, which simply means that we have a society that's constantly telling us, don't think about the Bible, don't think about the fact Jesus hung on a cross, don't think about the fact he was raised from the dead, don't think about the prophets, what you want to do is you want to rule your world the way that you want to rule your world. And then it's humanistic, which tells you don't place God at the center of your world. Why would you do that? You won't get to have your own way if you place God at the center of your world. Instead, you need to place yourself at the center of your world. Now, the Bible says that's going to make us foolish. And it's because if truth is suppressed, then we have to begin to talk about how sinful ways are strengthened in a life or a family or a society. And Paul goes on to say this, that it starts with sinful yet natural lust. He says, because they didn't want to honor God, therefore God gave them over to the sinful desires of their heart, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. In other words, if I don't honor God, then Mr. Magoo, who's short-sighted and who doesn't see how life should go, Mr. Magoo says, you who, man, let's, let's start disco dancing and let's get involved in sexual immorality. And fortunately, I forgot most of my disco moves that I used to know years ago. But, but we began to degrade each other with natural lust. It's natural for a man to want to be with a woman, but it does so much damage to families whenever we don't honor God's intention in our marriages. And then he goes on and he says, we exchange the truth about God for a lie. And we worship and serve created things rather than the creator who's forever to be praised. Now, why is there so much sin, not just in culture, but why is there so much sin in the church? Well, I want to give you a real compassionate, helpful answer this morning, and this is why the sinful nature of a Christian is no better than the sinful nature of a lost person. Listen to arguably the greatest uh, leader and Christian of the first century, the Apostle Paul, and he's writing of himself in Romans 
7, verse 18, and he says, I know that good itself doesn't dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do good, but I can't carry it out. He said, my flesh causes me to be drawn to compromise things that God's called me to in the name of pleasure all of the time. Now, if you don't want to live that life anymore, I'm going to give you two scriptures that will cause you to love God's way more than loving the ways of the flesh. And all you have to do is practice these for a long season in your life. Number one, Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is alive and it's active and it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of my heart. So a lot of us will say, I don't want people to judge me. And people aren't supposed to judge you according to scripture. People are supposed to love you and be kind to you and teach you the truth according to scripture. Now we are supposed to willingly invite people who are mature spiritually to judge our hearts according to scripture. And James 5 says there will be healing in our life if we learn to go to mature Christians who love us and say help me judge the thoughts and the intents of my heart better. And in the Lord's Supper we're told that many are sick and many are enduring very difficult circumstances and the reason is they haven't learned how to let the Lord judge their heart. Now how does God judge our heart? Here's the second scripture Romans 12 2 don't conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you'll test and approve what God's will is his good pleasing and perfect will so you'll never love God's will until you confront what keeps you compromising instead of doing God's will but whenever you say to God God, you know what? I'm just going to test you. And uh, the Bible says here's what you're going to find is that God's will is good. And what he means by that is it's good in everybody's sight. When somebody lives godly, everybody around them is blessed, and God's will is good in everybody's sight. Then it says it's pleasing, and this means fully pleasing. Whenever people live God's way, life becomes on earth like it is in heaven, and it becomes such a pleasing environment to be a part of. And then it's says it's perfect and the Greek word means you have to mature your perspective and you have to think more like God before you're going to believe this is right. So the first stage is sinful yet natural lust that some of us we want to do things our way because we want pleasure and God has to convince us that his way is going to bring greater pleasure into our life. Then here's the second stage according to the apostle Paul and that is sinful yet natural lust gives way to sinful perverted lust and it says because of this God gave them over to shameful lusts even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones in the same way the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another and men committed shameful acts with other men and they received in themselves the due penalty of their error now when I got to that scripture I knew that there would be a absolute tension settled into the congregation this morning. And do you know why there's an absolute tension? It's because in America today, 60% of Americans believe that society should be accepting of homosexuality. Now, that question that Pew Research asks is a little bit, uh, it, it needs to be examined because many of us sitting here today believe that homosexuals should be treated with love, they should be treated with kindness, and they should be treated well. So do I believe that, uh, that society should be more accepting of homosexuals? I may believe that even though I don't believe that homosexuality is, is a lifestyle that God endorses in the Bible. But this is going to help you this morning, okay? I want to Germany years ago because I was going to preach and I wanted to go to the hometown where my ancestors came from on my father's side. And when I was there, I noticed some things. First of all, I noticed that one in 15 people were dressed in the attire of Muslims. And I thought, wow, that seems like a lot of Muslims for a European country. So I Googled it and I found out that six and a half percent of Germany is now Muslim. The other 
thing I noticed was there were so many couples that were going around and there was no wedding ring on their fingers. So I asked people, why do so few married couples, why, why aren't they wearing wedding rings? And somebody explained to me that it was quite common in their culture for people to stay married a while. And what would happen is men would just become the father of the home that they were with that woman of. And so traditional marriage had lost tons of ground in Germany. Germany. Now, here's what we need to do with our next generation as believers. We need to say to them as Christians, what values are going to define life in your generation? Because what we're going to find out is that the Apostle Paul doesn't endorse much of the way that people act based on what's in Romans chapter 1. But we're going to see what is the perfect way for us to respond as believers in this world where we see sinful yet natural lust turn into things that really the Bible calls a perverted lust. And then there's a third thing, and the Bible says this. It says that there can be an unbridled lust. And an unbridled lust, listen to what Paul said, because we'll all find ourselves in this part of the Scripture. It says, furthermore, just as they didn't think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what they shouldn't be doing. Now, the word depraved simply means this, that I don't accept of the principles that God said I should approve of. And here's what's important. We can be highly accepting and loving towards people without approving of everything that somebody believes in. And Paul's list is going to go on to tell us that there are things that I'm going to get in your kitchen when I read this next part, because there's a lot of things y'all are doing that I don't approve of of your pastor. I just want you to know that, okay? So I want to read them to you you, and I want you to think of all the people you know, including yourself. It says they've become filled with every kind of wickedness and evil and greed and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, and strife. Let me see your hand if you've ever met a Christian who caused strife. Would you lift up your hand? If you've looked in the mirror, you've probably met one who has caused strife. And then it says they're filled with deceit and malice and their gossips. My father-in-law pastored 50 years, and he said, Jim, just love people. He said, many of the people you're, you're, you're past, you'll pastor are going to say bad things, and you're going to feel like their tongues are so long they could sit in the living room and lick a spoon in the kitchen. Hallelujah. But he said, just keep loving them and watch what they become. And then it goes on and says they're slanderers, and, and they're God-haters, and they're insolent, and they invent ways of doing evil. Finally, Paul said that the people are so messed up, and they do so many things wrong that you need to realize that's just part of life on planet earth. But then he says in verse 32, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do them, but they approve of people who practice them. Now I'm going to read you the next verse after Paul talks about how sin gains hold in a society through natural sinful lust. It strengthens itself and then there's uh, what the Bible calls perverted lust, which is not even the intended way that God God told us to live our lives, and then he said it's going to be unbridled. And what that means is that in society, you are going to be considered a bad person if you say that God's Word says this, and because of that, I'm not accepting of everything that's going on in culture. And to the, the Christians of that century, they would laugh at us as Americans because that was just a way of life to them. It was a very polytheistic, pagan society that they were in. And Paul tells them, now listen, here's how you need to live. So let's pay attention to this. He says, therefore, you have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you're also condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Paul says, listen, you are on this lust and sin chart, and because of that, you should be treating people with kindness and respect, and you should be treating them as a person whose life God has redeemed because you're not perfect either. And then he goes on to say this in Romans 2, 4, he says, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness and his forbearance and his patience, not realizing that God's kindness is actually intended to bring people to repentance? 
repentance. Here's the question. Who have you been really kind to lately? And because of that, it's made them think more about who God is and how they should live their lives. Because can I tell you what I've learned living for Jesus for 44 years as a first-generation Christian who had many friends who did multiple things that were on that list whenever I first came to Christ. Here's what I learned, that if somebody doesn't like me, because of Jesus and because of his word, then that's no big deal at all because I'm called to bear persecution for the word's sake because I love people. Can you say amen? But if somebody doesn't love Jesus because of what I do, that's a very big deal because he shed his blood and I don't want to do anything that turns anybody away from the abundant and eternal life that Jesus Christ came to bring. And Paul makes that very, very clear in the first and second chapter of Romans. Then in the fifth chapter, he talks about, okay, what causes the glory of God to be released among a people? And remember, most of the time when we read this chapter, we're going to read it based on circumstances we're facing, that we want God to do this. But when the Romans read this, they were highly persecuted by Judaism, highly persecuted by the Roman Empire. And so they were thinking about culture in general whenever they read this verse. And here's what Paul wrote. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through Jesus, and we've gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand. And he said, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. That's how we release the glory of God. We boast about the glory of God. We don't do unkind things. It doesn't mean that some people don't have to make very hard decisions about policy. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, about other things of life. But as the church, what do we do? We boast about how good God is and how heavenly God can make life on earth. Now, if you think that's going to eliminate all persecution, then that's a pipe dream. Because Paul goes on to say, even if you do that, he says, you're going to go through suffering. And you're going to have to persevere while you're taking this suffering in an ungodly society. And you're going to have to have some character. But the cool thing is, character is the thing that sin robs society of that keeps society from the blessing of God. Can somebody say amen? So we're an illustrated sermon, and the Bible says when we live with that kind of character, we actually bring hope into the world. So let me give you a word picture. Tamara and I, we always do something with our family on Sunday nights. Uh, we used to have Sunday night church service but then we saw society was so busy that we encourage you to strengthen your family on Sunday nights. So the other day I was looking and I found something that had all the favorite recipes in America since 1940. So it said every year what the favorite recipe was. And I told Tamara, why don't we start introducing our kids to some of these cool desserts? And I just started boasting. Who remembers Banana Foster? Come on, somebody. And, and then how many, you know, bread pudding. That's, that's phenomenal. And there are some I haven't eaten in a while, like upside down pineapple cake. Man, how many of you think upside down pineapple? pineapple cake is the will of God. And then my mom was a cook, man, and so we had hummingbird cakes. You say, what is that? Well, they don't put hummingbirds in it, so don't worry about it, but I promise you, you will attack that cake like a hummingbird if somebody makes this cake properly. You say, what are you doing? I'm just glorying in what makes life so good and so happy. And Paul says, that is where the power is. If we want to release God's glory into the earth. And listen, the cancel culture is all about suppression of the truth. There's an agenda where people don't want God. They don't want the Bible. They don't want the church. They don't want all those things. But I got news for you. Christ is more powerful than the cancel culture. And we can see God do some amazing things in the days ahead. And I want you to know something about your pastor. I want you to know there's four things you can always count on me for if you give me the honor of being your pastor. Number one, you can always count on me to be your ally. I'll always pray for you and your family. And I'll always work very, very hard that when you bring a family member to church, that they know that your pastor's kind and they know that your pastor's loving. 
The second thing I can promise you is I'll never avoid biblical truth. And the reason I'll never avoid biblical truth is because Matthew 7 says that if we don't honor biblical truth, then the storms of society are going to damage the, our family. So I need to love you, and I need to be able to speak God's word and the truth in love as I love you. The third thing you can count on is that you're not going to have an angry preacher. If you, some of you grew up that way. Every time you made a mistake, your parents got angry at you. You can make a lot of mistakes here because I know it's my call to perfect the saints. And if you get perfect, I'm out of a job. So don't worry. I'm not going to get angry at you, but I'm going to be your ally. I'm never going to avoid biblical truth, and I'm not going to get angry. I'm going to stay kind. And then there's a, a fourth thing that I probably don't talk as much about, and that is you can count on me to act socially in ways that honor God and that keep people safe. I'll give you an example of that, that if somebody applies to work in our youth ministry, they have to go through a background check. And sometimes people have things in their life that that, that background check, I don't have a choice as a pastor because statistics would tell me that I would put the kids of the church at risk if I started not being fair to that background check. And I'll give you an example. We had somebody years ago. Here's another example. They put their, their child in our nursery, and the child got bruised. And after seeing the child bruised for a few weeks as a pastor, I have to act socially responsible. And I have to say, now, I'm going to have to inform the Child Protective Services that your child's being bruised every week. And uh, that child ended up being bruised because of leukemia, and when we got done, she was the first baby in the history of M.D. Anderson ever healed of the cancer that that baby had who was in our nursery. So I'm just telling you, when we do what God says and we act responsibly, socially, that, that, that really does good in the world. And I want you to know something about how I was raised. I was raised with a mom who was a Democrat and a dad who was a Republican. So when I sat at the dinner table, I would listen to my dad talk about how government was too big and it needed to get its hands out of the business world's pocket. He worked for PPG Industry. And I said, amen. That made a lot of sense to me as a young man. Now, my mom was raised on a farm and she believed that farmers weren't valued and that somebody needed to do something to make sure that farmers were taken care of. And my mom had a mercy gift and she didn't like seeing the working class exploited. She believed they should be valued. And it was very easy for me as a kid to say amen to my father. And it was very easy for me as a kid to say amen to my mother because they were both standing for biblical values that were good for our society. Can somebody say amen? And so I grew up that way as a person. And when you come to church, you can see that I really value diversity. I like to give people room to grow in their walk with God and to follow God fully. But as society gets darker, there are things with the influence of our church that at times I'm going to have to act socially to protect people. And one of those things is what happened in our community about the books in our library. My wife decided to be one of the people who read the books. And those things aren't good for our culture. But I can tell you this. I'm always going to be for you and your family. I'm never going to avoid biblical truth. I'm not going to be an angry person, but I'm going to stand up and I'm going to act so that the children of our community don't have their innocence stolen. They don't have their impressionability stolen. <laughs> but they're going to know whether we're in the minority or whether we're in the majority as Christians. How many of you believe Jesus came to earth and because of that, we have the awesome privilege of living an abundant life? And how many of you know not only that, one of these days we're going to see the awe of heaven and we're going to know that Jesus was the greatest thing that ever happened to mankind. Can you give me a good amen this morning? I'll tell you, what a text to teach. What a scripture to teach. But thank you, you're, you're so attentive. And I want you to put your hand on your heart. I want to pray for you. And I felt like the Lord gave me a word for you as I was praying. And that is, I feel like God wants to fill some people with hope. You're facing the gory in your family. 
You're facing the glory. Don't let discouragement win when you're facing the glory. Keep glorifying who God is. Keep glorifying what God can do. And he'll just keep bringing forth more hope. That's what we're going to do. And we're just going to see so many people saved in this season. We're going to see lives blessed in such wonderful things. But listen, just talk to the Lord for a minute and just let him know, Lord, I'm not going to get discouraged. I'm not going to be defeated. I'm not going to quit glorifying your name whenever life becomes difficult. But I'm going to learn to walk with you. And I'm going to learn like Pastor did when he stood on the set in Uganda. I'm going to learn that when I don't have a clue, God still knows what to do. And he knows how to bless me. Amen. Our worship team is going to come back and they're going to sing the reprise to close the series with. And when they sing it, I just want to encourage you that with all my heart, I believe God is going to strengthen hopes in your heart. Some of you have given up on hopes. God wants to strengthen them. As we sing, just say, God, I'm ready for you to do a great thing in this season of my life. For some of you, he's going to continue to speak after this, this service is over. Man, let God speak and bring forth a new season of hope for you. Before they come, I want to pray for people as we stay in an attitude of prayer. And maybe you're here today and, man, you see how sin's at work in society. And maybe you don't even know what to do about it. Or maybe your own sinfulness has made you wonder if God even loves you. I want to encourage you that he does. And the Bible is very clear. It says this, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord can have God save their life. And there are people here today who say, man, sin's harmed me. I've done things that have caused sin to harm other people. And today I believe in Jesus Christ. I want to start a relationship with him. Or maybe you've had a relationship you want to return to him today. If that's you all over this place, we want to pray for you. You say, why do you pray for me? Why can't I just do it at home? Well, Jesus said we're to publicly confess him before people. And so this morning, we want to help you do that. We're going to pray with you at your seat. If today you say, man, I'm ready to start a relationship with God, or I'm ready to return to God, with every head bowed, every eye closed, just lift your hand all over this place. Just wave that at me real quick. You can put it back down. Such a joy every week to pray with people who are giving their life to the Lord. You say, today's my day, Pastor. Would you pray for me all over this place? Amen. Thank you, thank you. Amen. Right there. Let me ask you another question. Anybody need to come back to the Lord? If that's you, just wave your hand. Just put it up quick. Awesome right there. Anybody else? You say, man, I'm coming back to the Lord. Fantastic. Okay, well, church family, you can look up. Let's put our hand on our heart. Let's pray this together. Say, Jesus, thank you so much for providing the gift of salvation. And Lord, for showing us how amazing God's love truly is and his power to save. Lord, I don't want sin messing up my life or messing up others through me. But Lord, I want you in control. So today, I say no to sin and I say yes to you. Thank you for the amazing gift of salvation and all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, church, haven't you enjoyed this series, Creating a Beautiful World Together? And it's been so good. Would you stand to your feet with us? We want to close out this series with worship. And we're going to sing that song again. And I just want to invite you, man, let's make it our prayer. Let's pray it from our hearts this morning. Come on, let's sing. Let heaven come. Let heaven come. That's our prayer this morning. Let heaven come.
Uh, well, they're going to put the Lord's Prayer on the screen, and I want us to pray it together. So as they put it up there, would you read it with me? And let's not, let's make it our prayer. Let's make it our prayer from our hearts this morning, all right? Let's read it together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, come on, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Come on, can we give God praise this morning? And yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory forever, amen. Oh, yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory forever, amen. Oh, yours is the kingdom. prayer, isn't it? How many of you want to see heaven come? Amen. What a powerful, what a helpful series this has been. You know, having our hearts fed well every week by Pastor Hears from God makes such a difference in our lives, doesn't it? Can we give Pastor Jim a good hand for such a great word today? If you would you be seated for just a moment, I want to receive our tithes and offerings for God's work. You know, Pastor Jim has always treasured the diversity of our church family. He's always enjoyed people learning God's truth and living out that truth in their own world. And, um, you know, I, I was a part of the city council meeting this Tuesday, as some of you were and others in our community. And... Uh, and to, to be a part of protecting the innocence of our children in this community. And, you know, the scripture says in Proverbs 31, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. And I know we have raised five, four kids, not five, four, four kids in this community. And, uh, you know, you've raised your kids and are raising kids now. We have five grandchildren now that are being raised in this community. And we know how impressionable kids are, don't we, at that age, at such a young age. He mentioned a few, uh, he mentioned about some of us uh, reading books. We reviewed books from the library, and uh, we checked quite a few of those books, and there were more books than what we even realized that were in our library. We reviewed them and all read the books. I did that. My daughter did that. Many of you in here did that. Many of our, in our community did it. And these books we found were inappropriate. They were obscene and uh, very harmful, really, to the health of our children. And so, um, you know, we, we, I know we live in a community. We know we are people who want to see the children that we're seeing raised up protected in an innocent age, right? And so um, we believe that that's what we're doing now, and we're so thankful to have a part of that. But I wanted to just to tell you today, after service, that we will have some sheets that are available. If you would like to sign them and help us, uh, help be a part of doing that in our community. I want to just read. They'll be in our lobbies, both lobbies, and in our Connection Center. And I want to read uh, just real quick what it says so you'll know if you choose to sign this. We strongly urge our city and county representatives to protect the innocence of children through content and age-appropriate books, materials, and activities purchased with our taxpayer dollars, grant-funded money, and or money donated to the Victoria 
public library. So that will be out there for you to sign. <laughs> Wanted to make that available to you, and I want to just thank you for living out your faith, faith family, and thank you for making, for giving in a way that God can uh, get out what he wants done in this city and beyond. Amen. So let's prepare our hearts to give to God this morning. <laughs> your phone or the envelope uh, in the seat back in front of you. Let's hold it up and bless it uh, this morning. Father, we love you, and God, we thank you that we get to give and be a part of what you're doing, Father, on this earth. Thank you that through our tithes and offerings, Lord, you're making a difference. You're making a difference in us, in our, in our church, in our community, and, and God, even all the way around the world. So we just give so thankful, Lord, that we get to be a part of that. And we give with a cheerful heart. I pray a blessing over the tithes and offerings that they go a long way for your work and over the giver as we give with a cheerful heart this morning in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Well, church family, it was so good to be with you guys this morning. How many of you guys are glad you came to church this Sunday morning? Yeah. Before we go, I want to remind you of a couple things. Um, Ms. Tamara talked earlier about our Welcome Hub. We're launching our Welcome Hub this morning. So if you're new and you'd like just more information on how we can serve you, we'd love just to have an opportunity um, to get to know you and to just learn how we can serve you in any way. So answer any questions you have. So you can make your way straight out the back to the Connection Center. It'll be right on your left at the Welcome Hub. We're so glad you're with us this morning. I also want to remind you that our prayer team will be up front. So if you came wanting personal prayer, they would love to pray with you this morning. Just come up front after service, all right? Well, let me pray a prayer of blessing over you before we go. Sound good? Let's pray. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. You guys have a great day. We'll see you. Well, church family, wasn't that such an awesome service? What a powerful way to close out our series. And we are so glad that you could be with us this morning. We hope that today's service really blessed you. I just wanted to take a second and say, when Pastor was giving that salvation call, if you gave your life to Jesus for the very first time today, we just want to let you know we are so excited for you. And guys, we are cheering you on. We want you to know we don't want you to walk this out alone, but we as your church family, we want to be right here with you. And we have a special gift that we have for you. It's a 30-day devotional that Pastor Jim has written. And guys, we'd love to get that in your hands. So if you'd message us, we can get your information or you're welcome to stop by the church office any day of the week and pick up that devotional. We also have some cards that have helpful links for you. But church family, we love y'all so much. Again, this was a powerful service. So don't forget, we have second service coming up here in a few minutes. So invite your friends to join us, share the link online, but we love y'all so much. We pray you have a blessed Sunday and a blessed week, and we'll see you back here on Wednesday night.